Hello. Hello. Good evening. Well, good afternoon. Evening for you. Yeah. Well, it's evening for me. So, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we have a um, few folks that are already here. So, um, so I wanted to. Do you do you want to share um, the PowerPoint so you can kind of run it a little bit because it is about you. Um, so we can um, you just go on to the the first one. I can kind of talk about it and then this way I can see the Q&A box if anybody has any questions I can try to try to bring it up okay sure mm -hmm. let me uh... there you go does Wait. it share do you see it as a sideshow yeah, yeah, I can see everything. So if you want to just kind of jump onto the next page, I just kind of want to go over. Um, so if anyone, you know, for those that don't have never been to an AMA, that's sort of ask me anything, but we're going to do it in a sort of interview style, right? We're going to keep it pretty casual. Um, you know, it's an evening time. I think a lot of folks are just finishing dinner. If you're on the East Coast, you know, so we really want to get to know Naomi about her, you know, her experience, her journey. Um, as a high school student, all the way up until where she is now, a double PhD at Princeton University, which is, I can't really wrap my mind around the fact that you're a double PhD, considering I'm a PhD dropout myself. Um, <laughs> so we're going to keep this pretty light. Uh, we're going to do a lot of Q&A. Um, so anyone has any questions, we have the we have in Zoom, there's a Q&A section that, you know, anyone can go in there and type up questions um, or, you know, raise a hand, but we're going to try to keep it pretty, pretty consistent throughout the, um, throughout the presentation. We're going to have lots of time for, for questions later on. All right. So, um, hey, Mia, you want to start by just going to the next one and start talking about yourself? <laughs> Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, my name is Naomi Guillemette. I am currently a third year graduate student at Princeton University and has, as Dan has started mentioning, I am doing a dual PhD in chemical and mechanical engineering. Um, I've come a long way, although not locationally, because I'm, a, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, but I've come a long way from where I've started from, um, from my peers to coming to where I am and being able to go to undergrad university at Columbia and study chemical engineering as well there, all the way to doing research at Princeton and pursuing my PhD degree. So I'm excited to talk further and you know, I'll talk any more about my journey about any questions anyone may have. Thank you for having me. Great. So yeah, if you want to kind of move on to the next page, we have a lot of your experience, right, um, included. So I know there's a lot. Um, I guess I'll let you pick and choose. I mean, I'm really interested in some of the, you know, some of your um, extracurriculars, you know, in terms of, um, I mean, you've done so much. I mean, I don't even know where to start. There's, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack here, um, but definitely, you know, you can pick and choose things that you feel like that are more significant um, as part of your journey. Or, I mean, I, I think obviously the education um, degrees speak for themselves, right? But maybe you can kind of highlight a couple of things in your resume that we can get to know you a little more. Sure, yeah. Um, so as stated on top, I've gotten my bachelor's of science at Columbia and I'm doing my PhD at Princeton. And right before all that, I've included research. So right from my first year at Columbia, I started doing research. I got the opportunity to work in a lab after a professor saw me working on a class project in the mechanical engineering, like general lab purpose working room. And he was like, hey, do you want to work in my lab? And at the point, although I did not know yet what exactly I wanted to do in the future, I thought it was a good opportunity. And so I started then. And so that allowed me the opportunity to start doing research from an early, early time in my undergrad career. And so I included my research ideas in undergrad, I worked on continuous graphene sheets and in graphene, I decided to like switch gears a little bit and I'm working on hydrogels and a lot of environmental work. Um, along the way, it has always been important to me to not only focus on school, but other things like make 
lived experience that much more beneficial and giving back to others, sharing the experience and um, lessons I've learned and the knowledge I've learned the, along the way to make of it easier for others. So some ways I've done that are by being a teaching uh, tutor throughout all my years at Columbia. I was a teaching assistant. I've also sought out opportunities for teaching at Princeton as well. I worked through their preparatory program where they mentor um, high achieving low income students in the Princeton area through different um, throughout their high school years, throughout the college process. Um, and I also do um, other things throughout the Princeton campus. I've joined the other affinity orgs to try to um, we create programming, different program for other graduate students to attend. So that way there's a way to unwind after events. So I think it's important to cultivate both your academic life and science things, if that's what you're interested in, but also cultivate your personal life and other things that um, you can give back to the community and other things that bring you joy. Great. So um, I'm actually really interested in um, the high steppers step dance team. Um, <laughs> so kind of maybe you can highlight that a little bit. How did you get into actually, it? <laughs> actually, yeah, um, nice question. I for about the high steppers step dance team, I had not my high school growing up in Brooklyn, they had a step dance team, but I had not had the opportunity to join. I was nervous. And so when I got to Princeton, I was like, you know what, you're a grad student. You're doing this research thing, but you this is an opportunity to put yourself out there, add a little more free time. And so about spring of 2021, um, I saw there was auditions and I was like, you're going. I told myself, I worked myself up to go and I went, I made it onto the team. And here I am this semester, I am the artistic director for the team. And we just had a show like literally last Friday and Saturday where we put on a whole showcase, um, the 20th anniversary show. And I was doing so much more than I ever thought that I could ever learn to do. So, which has been a very like cool and enriching experience that you would never think like doing a PhD in science and chemical engineering that you're like directing a dance show. Um, so there's like a lot of opportunities. That's amazing. <laughs> do different things. Great, great, awesome. Yeah, um, so if we wanna move on to the next slide, um, we can, uh, <clears throat> So again, like I think the questions are posted here, they're pretty straightforward. So I have um, a graduate degree in education. So I know nothing about chemical and materials engineering. In fact, those words are very daunting to me, like just reading those words out loud, saying them out loud. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between chemical and material engineering? Sure, sure. Um, well, chemical engineering as a broad field is the process of trying to innovate, innovate processes or create new things in better ways, but specifically through the means by using um, chemical ideas um, and chemistry concepts to add, um, to add, to make and decrease molecules, to make up molecules, to make new materials from other materials. Um, Chemical engineering is extremely broad. There are a lot of things that fall under its category from cosmetics to oils, to plastics, to truly anything. Anything that involves creating a material involves chemical engineering because there is um, a chemical reaction happening at some point. And even things down to process control where you have plants and having to make sure that different parts are, different machines are in control with each other that still falls under chemical engineering. So chemical engineering is extremely broad. Um, and it's a really exciting field that if you're just interested in engineering and creating new things and exploring new concepts, chemical engineering pretty much, uh, you fall under that. It also has quite a bit of mathematical concepts in there. Materials engineering is more so concerned with how we can use materials to make better things. It's more in the exploration of materials. So in chemical engineering, you may be studying how to, perhaps you may be studying a specific polymer and how its properties um, react to light and how its properties react to heat and how its properties react to pH changes. Whereas materials engineering, you'd be broadly looking at a range of polymers and deciding which one of these has the highest mechanical energy and using that for your purpose and moving on. So materials engineering is more concerned about um, studying different materials that they could be um, composites or 
different kinds of things like that. Um, all of these fields are important and exciting because there's so much you can do. There's always new novel concepts coming out. There's always new and exciting research happening in these fields. For example, one really cool thing that people may not realize with material engineering is the surface of planes need to be um, really studied by material engineers, especially like fighter planes or anything to make sure like their services are not detect detected by radar for if that's something that's necessary or to make sure that their the surface is not causing too much friction in the air. So that's something that teams of material engineers get together to decide what is the best material to use for that um, purpose. Um, and so there's always exciting things, no matter what you're interested in, you'll probably find a research lab working on it. Um, so it really paves the way for you to go. And for career paths um, that are available, for chemical engineering, the exciting thing about it is that because it's so rigorous at the end, if you do decide you do not want to continue with doing a chemical engineering career, you absolutely can't. You absolutely are open to that. Um, the job market is quite receptive to chemical engineers truly in anything. I have friends that have switched over to finance just because they felt like it. I had friends that went over to med school because the concepts you learn in chemical engineering and the way you learn how to think and connect things together to solve problems is seen as a valuable skill. So that's exciting. And if you decide to stay in chemical engineering as well, there are a broad range of careers as well to go into. If you're interested in pharmacy, that's also an option. If you're interested in oil, that's an option. If you're interested in plastics or in environmental work, that's an option. If you're interested in cosmetics, that's also an option. Um, it's extremely broad, or if you're interested in technology, that's an option as well. Um, so the really exciting thing about these career paths is that there is a lot of things to explore and you're never really locked into one thing. If you study one type of material or one type of chemical now, you can always switch over to something new and exciting later on down the line. Okay, just a quick follow-up on that. I mean, I can definitely tell that how excited you are about both these fields, um, do you have any sort of trajectory of where you want to head it after completing your degrees? I mean, I don't know if I want to, I'm jumping ahead <laughs> of, you know, later on, um, but is um, there anything that you're thinking of right now? Um, I am actually unsure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I am unsure. I am leaning towards um, a career in, that includes technology and environmentalism. Um, whether that means industry or academia, I don't know yet. Um, but I know I do know that I want to work um, on improving things, definitely in the engineering field, definitely maybe not in the research lab sense where I'm in the lab actually doing the research, but where I'm exploring new materials. So I'm definitely very excited about that. Okay, great. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next set of questions. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I guess talk a little bit about sort of how how you became interested in engineering, right? And I think, you know, we have some wonderful pictures here, uh, like a paint night, right? <laughs> it looks like, <laughs> um, I mean, that's chemical engineering. There's a lot of, you know, um, paint material that's that's in there. Um, and I'm assuming that's your high stepping, high stepper group, yeah, right? That is. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. What sparked my interest in engineering? Okay, what sparked my interest in engineering actually was way back in high school. So I went to a high school where they actually had a major system. And so by your junior year, you had, by your sophomore year, you ranked the majors that you wanted to be like considered for. And they sorted the students into the system based on their grades from the past, from the first two years. And so at that decision point, I remember that I was deciding between chemical engineering, which was an option at that school, or law and society. I thought, up until that point, I thought debating was really fun. I was like, let's do this. I feel like I would be successful here. But I had just taken chemistry that sophomore year, and my chemistry teacher was like, you really seem like you're doing well at this. You should do chemical engineering. I feel like you would enjoy it. And I really sat down and thought, I was like, well, I, I do enjoy this. I had just never, I did not know what chemical engineering was as a field. And so at the time, it was more like, my decision came down to, I decided, well, if it's Saturday night, do I want to sit there doing like a chemical engineering problem or do I want to sit there having to write an essay? And I decided that the joy I felt at the end of finishing a problem where, although it was complicated, it took hours, but at the end, you're like, you got that number, you boxed it in and it felt successful from having like 
figuring it out versus like finishing an essay. Yes, there's a joy in finishing it, but I decided that like I appreciated the challenge that chemical engineering brought. And so I decided to study chemical engineering and I have not regretted my decision. It was extremely exciting in high school. I decided to continue through college. It was difficult. I will say that as an engineer, any engineering degree is. It was a lot more math than I had first thought because engineering is a lot of math. I think that's something people should know. Um, having a strong background in math or physics will help you in any engineering field because yes, there are chemistry concepts, but then math comes in to tie it all together. So I think if you're deciding to do chemistry and chemical engineering, like if you like math, chemical engineering is your answer. If you like chemistry, like basic, basic chemistry concepts, chemistry is your answer. Um, and so classes that I ended up taking in high school were AP chemistry. I found that extremely exciting. Um, I also took intro to organic chemistry in high school, which because it was taught in like a more relaxed environment, after when I saw organic chemistry in college, I was not at phase by it because I was like, this is something I've seen before. This makes sense, which I think some classes, sometimes you can get in your head with being like, everybody says this is so hard. It's going to be terrible. Um, but yeah, these classes are difficult, but they're definitely doable. They're so exciting. That it's very experience, it's very rewarding. Um, and my experience at Columbia was very exciting. The classes were difficult, but again, very rewarding. I tried to stay connected to the community as well. Um, my experience at Princeton has been, again, very wonderful. I've included some pictures here. The first image here is me doing experiments with the high school students that I work in. I teach a summer school teach science program. And that was just them um, being real, very excited about the results of an experiment. And it's really cool um, catching students' attention because some, not always do students come in ready, excited, but it's like when they'd even come in wanting to be excited, but it's like, that's just so cool. I can't help but be like, that's cool. And hopefully I get more students to think that I can do this too, that it doesn't take rocket science, it doesn't take a different level of genius that every person can excel in science if they want to. Um, I also included a paint night. I'm in, these are the diversity fellows at Princeton University, which is a fellowship program that they do. So like I make sure to cultivate like leadership skills and stuff because that's still gonna be useful. Um, because personally I wanna end up, if I end up in the workforce, not in a leadership position. So I wanna show that I'm able to lead, organize these kinds of things. And I included a picture of the dance team from our show Saturday night. So I think it's important to like cultivate things that you, you're interested in while cultivating skills that are important. It's great, it's great. Thanks for sharing, sharing all that. Um, so I have a background in undergraduate admissions. So, you know, I wanted to hear a little bit about your experience sort of applying to I me, mean, obviously, you know, both these two, two schools are very competitive um, and you didn't venture too far away from home. Um, so <laughs> I'm wondering sort of what is your experience with admissions process and, you know, in terms of, you know, meeting different professors and campus life. I mean, obviously, I think Columbia and Princeton are two very different schools. Uh, and also just being a graduate student versus an undergraduate student, that's a you know totally different experience, too. So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure, absolutely. So when I was applying, let's start with Columbia. When I was applying to Columbia, I did not know much at all, truly. Really. I was from a from Brooklyn, from a place like my parents did not know much about applications. And so I truly got everything from school. I got everything from my peers. I happened to go, I went to a school that you needed to take a specialized test to get in. So I ended up surrounded by High, high achieving students. And I truly, I have to admit the reason why I applied to Columbia was because my friends were doing it. I didn't think I was gonna get in. Um, I was just like, they're not gonna apply the day. And I was like, my friends are all doing it. And they were on the group chat, like, let's do this application guys. Like they're all motivating each other. And I was like, well, everybody's all doing it. Like might as well. And here we are. So <laughs> I'm saying like, don't underestimate yourself. Always go for that. You never know. Um, I definitely like my college counselor and the people around me. That's where I absorbed a lot of the information. Um, there are a lot more programs. There's a lot of opportunities, a lot of fee waivers and things that people don't find out about. So I'm like, super encouraged. Like if you have questions, go talk to someone, email somebody, ask questions um, because not always is information put out there freely. Um, getting to Columbia, let's see, um, the process to Princeton. Um, I had done 
I had not, at first I did not think I wanted to go to Princeton because I am from New York usually, originally I had gone to school in the city originally and that's because I wanted to stay around this general area. And so I was like, okay, maybe I should go farther away and also Princeton's in New Jersey, it's a little more secluded, I didn't know. But I had done a summer research experience at Princeton. And I think that was very interesting to see that, okay, I could definitely see myself at this lab. Actually, I'm working at the same lab in which I did my summer research experience uh, over that summer. So I think if you're interested in somewhere, look into it, see if they have programs where you can go visit the place. Sometimes they even have like one or two day visit things. Now that I've been at Princeton, I know that Princeton has these programs. Um, one of them is called Princeton P3. Um, where they bring you on campus for one or two days. You can talk to professors, you can talk to graduate students, you can talk to anyone you're really interested in and given a bunch of resources. Um, one thing I've learned at grad school is that there are a lot more resources than you realize, but you really have to go out there and talk to people to find them. Um, I've learned a lot of things in post, like after, but that's only given me more ammo and motivation to make sure I tell people so that they can like use them, use these resources as they're going through these processes. Um, I think one thing beneficial to being accepted into Columbia for me, I, I don't know for sure or anything, but I think one thing that worked in my favor was that, yes, I wanted to do chemical engineering, but I, and I was interested in sciences, but I also was doing other things like debate team. I was doing, I feel like the well-rounded, like I liked many things. Don't, because if you like one thing, don't keep yourself only limited to doing that one thing. Yes, it's good to excel in that thing, but I think if you show that you are taking an interest in yourself as a person, an interest in life and people around you, that will work in your favor overall. Um, I think I haven't answered everything. Yeah, I think the next slide, is that about your work that you're doing right now? Um, uh, I think it's, oh, it's a good transition so. into, okay, <laughs> great, there you are. <laughs> um, yes, I recently published a paper this past February um, and it was really exciting because um, the American Chemical Society used our, they asked us for a picture. And so they, this is a picture that we submitted for the cover as well. And Princeton also like did a blurb about it. It was really exciting because personally, I always hesitate to think I'm doing anything so cool. So it's so exciting to see that people are interested in your research and that like anyone could do this. And so I'm like really telling people like, hey, they, they put me on this. You can do this too. I promise you. Like <laughs> um, everyone um, can really be successful. Oh. So yeah, so I mean, obviously, Polygens is a mentor based um, program. And certainly, we value um, people that, you know, serve as mentors, you're one of the mentors for our students, right? So yeah. we want to hear from you about, you know, the impactful mentors in your life. I mean, I think you have multiple people that's listed here. So I'd love to hear a little more about their role in your life and also in professional development, um, how they influenced you or how they helped you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excuse me. Um, I've had a few like notable mentors in my life and I think they definitely paved the way for who I was able to become in my career. Where I am now, I have not arrived yet, obviously. One is Dr. Chris DeMarco. Chris was my, he was a PhD student at the time. I worked in the lab and I worked with Chris very closely. And so Chris was completing his PhD degree. And from day one that I walked in as a freshman, although I was like, I have nothing to contribute. Like, don't, you know, you're not gonna listen to what's coming out of my mouth. Like, what do I have to say? He always respected anything that I, any opinion I had to say, always like, what do you think? And always treated us, treated me like a researcher like really held accountability, taught what it's like to be in a lab, um, taught what it's like to manage your time, um, to do work-life balance, to do how to set up an experiment, how to think critically about how to do the next step. Um, and just making sure that throughout the whole time that my undergrad education was like, everything was going well and that I was supported and that like, I really saw his mentorship as like a good example of like how one should be, could be a successful PhD student and how it was attainable and how you, and how it was like, oh, this is a regular person who's doing it. And so it made me feel like that I could actually apply and do it too. So he was a big mentor in that way, making it seem very attainable. And I moved on to Dr. Shaukwe. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton. 
And from when I started on as a first year graduate student, we start, we have been working on uh, projects together. And truly it's just been very informative the way it's very, let's say it was very helpful the way she taught. It was very straightforward. I think I learned a lot on how just to train someone else um, when coming onto a project with you. And also it was great to collaborate with her, coming up with new ideas. Um, collab I learned a lot about collaboration with her, collaborating with other people, um, coming up with new ideas, testing out um, new ideas off of like, let's just try this because I think it'll work like reading literature to find what's new out there and really perusing literature to find new things and how to incorporate those things into your project. And I think that's pretty invaluable for being a researcher in the long term. And last, but most certainly not least, is Dr. Rodney Priestley. He is actually the current dean of the graduate student, graduate school at Princeton University. And he is also my advisor. He's my PhD advisor. He has been, he was also the advisor I worked with the summer of 2019 when I worked um, that summer at Princeton. So from the first summer that I've worked with Rod until this very day, I feel like I've learned a lot about how to go through a project, about advisor-student relationship. He's always been extremely supportive while being um, pushed, not pushing, but like um, promoting excellence and pushing you to do better and pushing you to try out for new things and always so ambitious for you as well. And hoping that you get great things and looking at like, hey, maybe we should apply to this fellowship. Let's apply to this thing. And let's put your name on this grant. You can do this. I'm really just believing in you. So I really appreciate his mentorship. And um, I hope to embody the things that I've learned from all these people to my mentees as well. Um, I hope I teach them how to like properly manage their time. So whether they're being successful while being happy at the same time, how to like creatively think about new ideas, how to find new ideas, and how to incorporate them, incorporate that into their projects and how most of all to feel supported and feel um, supported while at the same time promoted and pushed to go farther um, without that being a weight on them, but more of a support, if anything, more of a motivation. Um, and I became a polyjet mentor for many reasons. For one, I want to give back the knowledge I've learned. I want to help other students like achieve their scientific goals. I want to inspire students to think that they can be researchers because they can, and to see that they, they can think critically and that they can explore these concepts. Um, and some of the some of the mentees I've had, um, my very my very first mentee, she's Hua An, she's from Vietnam. She's actually currently in the US doing her undergrad degree now. And we've actually published a paper together. Um, in a high school journal, national high school journal. It was about artificial photosynthesis, which is tangentially related to my work, but I was like, I am absolutely willing to work on you with this because it's about the process of research, about the process of looking through the topics. And so it was very exciting. We still keep in touch. She actually came to the Princeton area like a, a couple months ago because of a friend to visit. And she sent me an email, she's like, I'm around. Do you want to grab a drink? And we went and grabbed Boba. It was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's, it's really rewarding and it's as much as you want to give or take. It's, it's really wonderful to be able to help students, to see them grow, to see them grow intellectually as well in their confidence in the first meeting when they're like, am I doing everything right? To the last meeting when you see them confidently join and open the work that they've done. It's like, this is what I did. I'm asking for feedback. And it's really exciting to see that growth and um, inspire them to do greater things. That's great. I mean, I just want to kind of piggyback off that a little bit. I mean, I work with students who um, eventually, you know, be matched with a polygen's mentor. Um, this one particular student, he was doing a bioengineering project, and now he is a junior at Boston College, and his mentor has moved on from MIT to work in a lab, I think, from Cambridge University. They're still in touch, sort of outside of polygens, kind of similar to, you know, your experience with your first mentee. Um, and they're still friends, they're colleagues now, right? Yeah. Uh, which is great. Yeah, these are sort of organic relationships that develop through mentorship, in which they should, right? I think we're just a platform to kind of provide, um, you know, the matchmaking in a way, right? To find the yeah. students with interest in subject and in the, in the topic and somebody with an expertise in the area. 
but then you know the students and the mentor can kind of take it from there and then see how far it goes which is great yeah exactly it's really wonderful about that you're able to see where it goes and the potent the possibilities from us. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, move on to the next one. Oh, there you go. So I think we're at a point that I mean, I think, you know, for high school students to um, to kind of think about chemical material engineering, what are some advice you would give them? You know, I don't know if there are too many students they are going to jump to say, hey, I want to do chemical engineering, right? <laughs> they may want to start like, no, I'm interested in engineering. I like chemistry. I like, you know, lab science. And so maybe give some tips, you know, and talk a little bit about how to research projects and help the students kind of kickstart a career in chemical engineering. Yeah, I mean, chemical engineering is very exciting because almost everything has chemical engineering involved in it. Um, I would say if you are remotely or tangentially in, in, interested in chemical engineering, that you should try to take at least a chemistry course and see how you like it. Um, and if you're not even able to take a chemistry course, like truly open a chemistry book, because I think it's self, um, you're able to self-teach um, the beginnings and see how you like it. I would say try, if you like solving puzzles, especially like math puzzles or things like that, you'll probably like chemical engineering because it's some level of like solving puzzles using different concepts. I mean, in chemical engineering, it's kind of encompassing. It kind of includes mechanical engineering in it a little bit, kind of includes a little bit of electrical engineering in it a little bit. There'll be like some sections where you learn some of it. So like truly, if you're someone who likes puzzles, if you're someone who likes connecting things together in a creative way, um, chemical engineering is one for you um if you're and like thinking about research projects um there's truly so many even programmers there's chemical engineering um involved in that as well you can do um programming or simulations of either like a specific molecule or also like a phenomenon happening on earth i know the chemical engineers who are studying like how the ocean then moves and seeing what happens with that. There's truly, or there's chemical engineering studying like plants. I know chemical engineers that study how fish gills move and seeing how that helps propel them through the water or how hummingbirds move through the air and seeing, and they like build these simulations where they show like the bird's wings moving up slowly and out. And you would have thought that the chemical engineer is just doing a random, not random, but like doing things about biology and about motion. Um, but anything that involves like fluid mechanics, how things move, how things flow, even, truly anything <laughs> you could imagine. So I would say if you're interested in chemical engineering and you want to explore a topic and you truly don't know where to start, um, start with your favorite thing. Even if you start with something like a game, you can, you can even look at the chemical engineering of how the game's parts are made because you, can, you have to make sure that the pieces of the game don't heat up for the user friendly. That's something a chemical engineer is involved with. Even if you start with um, your, your game console, your computer, um, those are all things like the sound system. You wanna make sure the devices that go inside of your phone, that's something a chemical engineer is involved in making and they have to grow the silicon wafers and literally build the devices together and looking into new ways to build devices that work faster, if that's something you're interested in. Um, if you're interested in just cosmetics, chemical engineers look into how to make cosmetics that are have little colloids or little things in them that would help your skin better. Um, and how and they're interested in how to make emulsions so that way your cream doesn't break apart in certain temperatures or in travel. Um, so truly, like explore. I truly encourage you to explore because anything you're interested in probably has something that you can get involved in or something that you can even create your way in. And it's so broad that no chemical engineer is gonna tell you no. They will, they will, they will help you figure it out and go through it. I, I actually learned a lot. I mean, I had no idea <laughs> chemical engineering is involved in like microchips, right? You know, you talked about like computers, how things heat up, right? To kind of reduce the temperature to make um, parts can... functioning better, right? Or faster. That's amazing that it's um, it touches truly touches all aspects of life, right? 
um, yeah. which is, you know, I mean, I think, again, until I came into this, really thinking about chemical engineering as something that's beyond, you know, the basic high school chemistry class, right? But it's really, you know, fascinating to hear from your perspective how it really touches upon all aspects of engineering, right, in a way. So, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it makes it very accessible, if that makes sense, because you can definitely create a chemical engineering project at home with your own materials. Um, so it's very exciting. Safety first, though, right? <laughs> Truly, yes. <laughs> Not encouraging random experiments. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind going to the next slide, so I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, about uh, if there are students in the audience or there are, you know, IECs, counselors, parents. Um, so, you know, if you want to work with a mentor, um, like our wonderful uh, Naomi here, we can certainly, um, you know, pair you with somebody with expertise that can match the student's interest, right? So uh, my email is listed here um, and, you know, certainly go into our website and apply. Um, I don't see any questions uh, in our Q&A. Is there anybody with any questions that we can, can help you answer? So for me, I mean, I have a question. <laughs> it's not scripted. Um, so I have a um, seventh grader and a fourth grader. Um, now the seventh grader is a girl, fourth grader is a boy. You know, they're both interested in some aspect of engineering. But, you know, as parents, we say, hey, like we have, you know, they have these, they call a CCI lab or like robotic lab in school. But what they do in these labs is the time is limited, right? So they, they get to go once a week, maybe. So they do a lot of different things. And once they create a project, they bring it home, it's sitting there collecting dust, right? So how do we motivate our kids to kind of explore? I'm not, I'm not saying that they need to go into one direction or another. What are some resources that are out there that you think will be helpful to have younger kids not necessarily for high school, just to kind of get them started with engineering projects um, to, you know, to truly explore, see what they're interested in. That is a great question. Um, I unfortunately don't think there is one site that is like end all be all um, you can do. It's like you go on the site and there's like a list of topics, but I do think, and this is probably a little more work on the parent who may not have the time, but things like if you combine glue and water, not water, glue and um, what's the other ingredient? Um, you can order it online. In a certain ratio, you can then make these bouncy balls. So then, then the student, then not the student, but like your kid is like, well, why did that's weird. So like they inadvertently start asking questions like, why did that happen? This was just randomly glue and now it's this bouncy ball and you could get them into a competition to like, who can make the bounciest ball? Or like, is it gonna take more glue ratio or the other ingredients escaping me right now? It's a household ratio, household item as well. Um, but little projects like that or little competition, I think um, could be helpful. Then again, it is very hard. Personally, I was very, all over the place as a child. I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, I think- That's the beauty of it, right? Kind of not knowing yeah. what you want to do, but then, you know, there's so many options out there. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of fun YouTube videos, although that takes some sorting through. Um, mm. There are a lot, of, a lot of fun random YouTube videos that are like, hey, did you know that our contacts are made of polymers and also plastic bottles? Yeah. Same thing, same material, or like, which like, you know, at first maybe, a little difficult to find, but they are they are interesting and they are out there. Unfortunately, they're a little sparse. It's a little, it is definitely hard. Great. So we have a couple of questions here. So we have one um, from somebody I assume it is a student, um, but interested in biochemistry. Could I use this same similar advice for biochemistry, or is it vastly different in comparison to chemical engineer? Oh, sorry.
there we go. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes and no. Um, biochemistry and chemical engineering might be a bit different and like you might take some more biology courses in biochemistry whereas you would not take them at all in chemical engineering however in terms of like say your job prospects afterwards I don't think they would vary too much I think a person with a biochemistry degree would probably get the edge up at, an, at a firm that's something more biology related versus a chemical engineering person who's done none um, nothing really related to biology but I think the advice would be pretty much the same. I do would ex I would recommend you to explore both biology and chemistry classes because sometimes people realize later, hey, I like one more than the other. Or, but bio bio biochemistry biological sorry biochemistry is its own field, also exciting. Then, yeah. Great. Uh, I think we have one more here. Uh, what drove you to continue exploring academia instead of pursuing work in the industry? Good question. Uh, has that been a choice, been, been challenging? Curious about financial aspect of pursuing further education rather than going into the industry? Okay, that's a great question. Um, part of, so I was trying to decide if I wanted to continue into like, I haven't decided yet whether I'm gonna fall through its professorship, but whether I want to do a PhD or not, I haven't decided yet. I hadn't decided yet by my junior year of college. But by that point, I had been working in lab for a while. And I still had this preconceived notion that, like, you know, people who work in labs are just like, that's all they live, breathe, and do lab. Like, if I want to be a PhD student, that means I must, like, only live, breathe, and eat lab and not want to do anything ever. And maybe that's just not me because I'm social. I have a life. I want to see people. I want to do things. I, it's not for me. Um, but it hit like around junior year approaches that I'm like, it's about the time where I should be considering applying. And I really sat down and I was like, hmm, if I'm being honest with myself for the past three years, I have been working in this lab and it's been pretty great. I've been enjoying it. Like I've set myself up for this. Like, like it's not what I thought it was. This lab work is truly not, not as much as you, it's like actually a diverse group of individuals who like doing, um, different kinds of things who like going climbing, for example. Um, and so I was like, wait, like, I actually think I wanted to, so that's, that's one of the big reasons I decided to do it because I had already been doing research for a while and I realized I enjoyed it. Another reason why I decided to do um, in academia is because I thought as a person of color, as a minority, as a woman, it would only help my chances in the future in industry. And furthermore, I decided to do a PhD specifically as opposed to a master's is because in a PhD, you're funded, you're given, your schooling is funded and you're given a stipend to do this research. However, master's you'll have to pay. And if it would have to been for a master's, I would absolutely not been able to afford or do that at all. So I decided, and also like personally, I was over the classes part of it. The, the research part was interesting, but I was like, the master's is just the classes part. That's the part I'm trying to avoid <laughs> versus the PhD includes the research part, the part that does keep me interested. It, um, so those were all my various um, reasonings. I do, I've been very happy continuing my PhD. Um, it's been great um, exploring my research abilities. I feel a lot more confident about my ability to like present, which I think is gonna be valuable in industry if I decide to go there. I feel confident about my ability to like manage tasks. I've been able to like do different things on while being a PhD student that I feel like is gonna make me even stronger if I do decide to go into the academia, um, not academia, into industry afterwards. So I think it's a been, it's been a big pro. There's a lot of pros um, to it. And although my friends in industry right now are making a lot more money, I, did, I also did not want to go and come back because I was like, I don't want to take a pay cut. So that's why I decided to go straight. Um, so there's definitely a lot of pros and cons and things and factors to consider, but it's worked out well. Was it also right around like the COVID time that you had to make that decision or? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I was applying before, right before COVID hit, and then COVID hit, and all my decisions came in. So I started my whole first year of grad school online, which was truly a unique experience, <laughs> like like no other. Um, I think any I graduated online, another unique experience, like no other. I've had I think a unique experience throughout the, these years, and I think online schooling has shifted some things here and there. Um, for the some for the better, some for the worse, but overall it's been interesting. Okay, I think there's a follow-up. 
Um, let's see. The point about research being beneficial as POC, potentially wanting to go into industry was interesting. How has your experience been as a POC in academia? Um, how do you think that experience would differ for POC in the industry? Hmm. Interesting. Um, my experience as being in the labs is when you are in a lab, people are incredibly respectful of what's in your brain and the fact that you were a scientist here to work. It's, it is not an issue at all. It has been a wonderful experience. I enjoy being a researcher. Um, it's always been a rewarding experience. If in academia, I think that includes like classroom, classroom settings, that's everybody there. You may encounter someone who says comments like, but you, how did you do it? For no reason whatsoever. Um, but those are here and there and it's to be expected at these predominantly white institutions. Um, but overall, like where it matters, um, you are respected where there's a lot of support given, especially I think at Princeton grad school, there's a lot of programs. Again, it's a lot. I do encourage to take the initiative to go out and find them. That's one of the biggest things. If you have not, if you don't go out and find them, they won't, it's hard to find. But there are people who care and who are working to even the gap to make it, to make you feel welcome within an institution that was maybe not necessarily built for your comfort or built to welcome you. Um, but there are a lot of hard, a lot of people at work and a lot of resources that are available who won't let anyone fall through the cracks, who won't let. Um, so it's about if you're interested in being somewhere and you know you're a person of color and you're concerned about that, find someone else of color, email them, and they will absolutely. Everyone's just trying to help everyone, truly. Um, but everyone will help you out. There are a lot of programs available. Like, for example, at Princeton, there's GSP, which is Graduate Scholars Program, where everybody who wants to, there is no restriction. Anybody who wants to, um, as a first year, is accepted, and they're given an older year mentor. Um, along with three other students, they spread it out with different um, studies. So they'll give one engineering student, one natural science student, and one humanities student. And they just give funding. The Princeton gives you money and it's just to hang out, meet, have a group to acclimate to the area, to have a group to ask questions to like, where should I go for this? Who should I ask about this? What if, if I have a disagreement with my advisor, who do I talk to? What do I do? These kinds of like nuanced questions like, what do I say or where do I go if I need, if I have a financial issue or like a need, like who do I talk to? Or this is not very well outlined. Um, so yeah, there are people, but you have to find them. Um, but the money is there, let's put it that way. That's one good thing about going to like well-funded institutions. Great, well, thank you so much. I mean, really appreciate your time. And I personally learned a lot. I'm sure our audience learned a lot too. Um, so we're gonna continue to have these AMAs uh, going forward. I think our next one uh, is next week. I think it's on the next slide, if you don't mind doing one more click for me. Uh, so we have Nora to come and talk about history. So we'll send out more emails um, in regards to, you know, these AMAs. And anyone who has any questions, feel free to email us, um, contact us offline. But thanks again for joining us. And thanks again for our panelists. Uh, so ho hope everyone have a great night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.